Okay. So welcome to another day in paradise. You have nothing to do, just a few little chores. Make sure you rest, meditate, listen, ask questions when you need to. It's a very nice, simple uh, retreat. And hopefully that simplicity is going to allow beautiful states of mind to arise. Not all the time, because sometimes when a person has a very nice state of mind, maybe they get some nimitas or even deeper, there's a problem they sometimes have. They got a nice meditation once, and they always think the next meditation would also be good. And because of that, I developed a simile of the migrant. This migrant came over to Australia, from a very war-torn country. He was actually a doctor in the country where he was living, but of course his um, uh, qualifications were not recognized in Australia. So when he came to Australia, he had to get a job in the building site. He was young and fit and energetic. But after the first day in the building site in Australia, when he went home, his wife asked him, how much did you earn today? And he said, nothing. They didn't pay me a cent. But he went to work again on the next day and Wednesday. And when it got to Wednesday, he still hadn't been paid any money. And so he thought, these people in Australia, they just exploit poor migrants. They take advantage of them. He didn't want to go to work on Thursday, but he had nothing else to do, so he went to work on Thursday. And again he wasn't paid. He was very angry. But his wife made him go to work on the Friday. And on the Friday, in the middle of the morning, the boss invited him into the office and gave him a big pay packet. And then he said, well, you don't need to do much work this afternoon, just you can go home early if you wish. And then when he went home, he was so happy, and he told his wife, I finally figured out how things work in Australia. From now on, I'm only going to go to work on Friday. <laughs> on, on payday. Of course, you all know, you get paid on Friday in that system because of all the work you've done on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday as well. It's the same when you have a really nice meditation, a deep meditation. It's not just because now you know how to do it. It's like the paycheck for all the meditation you've done when you weren't seeming to get anywhere. You were getting still, 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 still and then you found you were very, very peaceful. That's how it works. So just because you got a payday, say yesterday, don't expect a payday today as well. <laughs> and just see how it happens. And little by little, the meditation gets more and more peaceful. And you get more paydays. And of course, the amount of cash in your, pay, in your payday gets more and more and more. So anyhow, one of the things I wanted to talk about today was something in meditation which is very, very important. It's a little bit negative, but nevertheless need to talk about it, understand it, and learn how to overcome it. And that is called the five hindrances. This is the things which stop meditation, getting really peaceful and very happy. And I'm sure that many of you in other retreats have heard of the five hindrances. They're not just hindrances to stillness, to samadhi. They also weaken people's wisdom as well. You can probably understand why. Those five hindrances, the first one is uh, desire, wanting, involved in the world of the five senses, which for most people is everything just about. And then there's the ill will. Then there's the sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry. And lastly, doubt. And each one of those weakens you know, your understanding, but more importantly, prevents stillness from occurring. And so especially the first one, like sensory desire, dealing with the world of the five senses. 
one thing which I was always inspired by when I heard this from the Buddha, if you indulge in sensory desires, it's like you go into debt. You're borrowing happiness from the future. And we have to pay that back later on. Instead, if you live a life of renunciation, in other words, you don't really indulge so much in, in sensory desires, you find that your average level of happiness goes up. It was a weird thing to actually to see this, because when I started keeping, say, five precepts, when I started becoming a monk, then people said, oh, what are you doing that for? You know, that life was peaceful, as many opportunities, you can get a job with money, there's so many things going on in London at that time, you can go and listen to the Rolling Stones or the Beatles, have a nice girlfriend, do whatever you want. And I said, no. When I renounced, I was actually happier. It was weird. But my smile got broader the more I kept those precepts. And I still remember to this day, I was teaching a meditation retreat once I was a monk in Australia. And of course, we didn't have our own retreat center. We had to use whatever retreat centers we could get. And this one was uh, in an old Catholic convent. They weren't using it, so we hired it for the weekend. And I remember just on interview times, I was between interviews and was just looking through the window. And there was two gentlemen who'd just been into the Catholic Church next door, were just saying goodbye to each other. And one of them said to the other, be good, and the other one said, no, that's no fun. When I heard that conversation, I thought, oh my goodness. These are supposed to be senior people, members of a church. One said to the other, be good, and the other one said, no, that's no fun. And if I had the opportunity, if there was a door that I would have gone out and said, told them, no, being good is fun, more fun. This, that's what I've discovered over so many years. Every time you restrain, live a simple life, a good person, number one, you don't have any fears at all. I don't know what would happen. So I know sometimes, sometimes in monastery, because I'm the boss monk there, the abbot, sometimes like a policeman will come. And many of the other young monks, especially the visitors, they see a policeman come to the monastery and they, you can see they're a bit afraid of something. And all they need is because maybe somebody has passed away and they need to inform me. And all sorts of reasons. But so many people, if a policeman came to your house, knocked on your door, would you be afraid? If you have done nothing wrong at all, of course you can't be afraid. It reminds me of a story which I've been telling many people this time of the year, because it comes up a lot in Western countries. It's about you know, when you go invited to parties at Christmas time or New Year. So this, <laughs> you know the story. <laughs> I just had to say the first line and cast because he remembers it all. This guy, he went to a, a, a party for his company and you know he had a few drinks, but you know, one drink led to another drink. You know, it was a bit sort of um, a subtle, as they say, maybe too much alcohol. And you have the choice, drive your own car home or get a taxi because you know you're you're over the limit with alcohol in your, your blood. He decided, oh, what the heck, chances of getting caught are very low. So he decided to drive his car home. And of course, it was his bad luck. He got caught in a road traffic block. The policemen were, were, the policemen were um, testing every driver who drove down this road. You know, even at some times, they're driving me home from a, a talk over in town, and you get stopped by the police. And many times, 
Now I'm in the passenger seat, and Anna Garica, my driver, is in the the um, the driver's seat. And a policeman looks in, and he sees me. He says, "Oh, Buddhist monk. Okay, off you go." <laughs> <laughs> At least we've got a good reputation now over in Australia. But anyhow, this guy got caught in the block and he was about to get tested. Did I tell this story the first day? No, good. Sorry? The talk over in a few days ago. There must have been the talk at um, Mahindarama. No, this trip, okay. You know the story though, don't you? <laughs> anyway, in those days you had to get out of the car and then they would test your, your blood alcohol level by having to blow in a tube. So he got out, he knew he was over the limit. He thought, oh, well, I'm going to lose my license, probably get a big fine, that's really awful. But nevertheless, I gave it a try and I can't sort of get out of this. So when they were about to give him the tube, there was a sound, crash! One car had been going a little bit too fast and there was a road traffic block and he couldn't slow down quick enough and he went into the back of another car. It was a road traffic accident. And the policeman said, it's more important that I check on this accident than test your blood alcohol level. So he told the driver, get back in your car and go home. He thought he was so lucky. He came within a second of getting caught. But anyway, the story wasn't over. <laughs> because the next day, he was woken up early in the morning. Someone was ringing his doorbell and they wouldn't stop. So he got out of bed, he stood in his pajamas, he had a hangover, and when he opened the door, there were two policemen outside. And he was scared at first, but then he thought, I'm not driving a car now, they can't do anything. So he relaxed and said, what do you want? What can I, how can I help you? And the two policemen said, would you mind if we look inside your garage? And he thought for a moment, why do they want to look in my garage? I've got nothing there, it's my car. And so he went to the garage, he opened it, and when he opened the garage for the two policemen to look inside, he almost had a heart attack. Because <laughs> in his garage, there was a police car. <laughs> his car was missing. He had been so drunk, and when they said, get in your car and go home, he got in one of their cars <laughs> and drove that home. <laughs> you know, I remember telling that story in Kuala Lumpur many, many years ago, and the following day, I was going to give a talk at Ippo, and they were going to drive me up there. And as I was driving in the car to go up to Ippo, they had the radio on it. And the radio presenter, I'm not quite sure what radio channel it was, they told that story. Someone had told the radio channel <laughs> and they repeated my story the very next day <laughs> about the guy who had a police car in his garage. But anyhow, that was just saying just how dangerous it is that when you have, uh, when you break precepts, when you indulge in sensory desires. But how can you keep that precepts in today's world? It was this disciple of mine, he said he really wanted to be a Buddhist. He wanted to keep the precepts, but that was one of the hardest for him to keep. When he went to a company function, they asked him, you know, would you like a drink, some alcohol? And he said, no, I can't take alcohol anymore, I'm a Buddhist. And he said one of his fellow workers said, oh, you're a Buddhist. Very good, that's a very lovely religion. Buddhism is all about letting go. Come on, let go, have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> and that never worked. But then he said he found the solution. Now when they, he goes to some company function 
and they bring around drinks of alcohol and they invite him to have a drink of alcohol. He says, no, I can't. Doctor's orders. And they always respect doctor's orders, so they leave him alone. When he told me that, probably what you're thinking too, yes, you're keeping one precept about alcohol, but you're breaking another precept, you're lying, you're perfectly healthy, the doctor never gave you any orders. And that's when he told me some Dhamma. He said, Ajahn Brahm, don't you know that many times in the suttas, the Buddha compared himself to a doctor. It was doctor's orders. Dr. Buddha's orders. <laughs> <laughs> so he was right. But anyhow, they always say that if you indulge in sensory pleasures, there's always a price to pay there somewhere. And if you can restrain yourself, your happiness, your safety level goes up. You've simply got nothing to be afraid of. And you know that because you're a good person, other people would also be good to you. I know that some people say they take advantage of you. No, I found more people are helpful, are kind, are good, when you're good to them. It's a beautiful thing to do, but desires actually stop you being good. What you want is more important than what you need to give. So, a lot of times, I know somebody said the other day, I answered the question, but I'm going to repeat it. What about, you know, the indulgence in food? That was something which always so sort of disturbed me. Because I always thought too, if you indulge in food, that's another sort of sensory desire that's going to stop you getting deep meditation, getting enlightened. And because of that, when I was a young monk, the food I ate in Northeast Thailand was disgusting. This was an indigenous culture. We'd only have one meal a day. And just to tell you the sort of food which I ate, this one day we had the ball of sticky rice, just sticky rice, you know, no salt, no um, there's no salt, there's no soya sauce, no chili, just sticky rice. And then each one of us, something to eat with the sticky rice, we had one frog on top of the sticky rice. <laughs> the frog. It wasn't fried, it wasn't roasted, it was boiled. No salt, no sort of seasoning. Just as if the frog had jumped into the, the bowl of hot water and then into your bowl. That's all you had for your one meal of the day. Frog on rice. And I, this is a good story to tell your children if they think that they don't need to study at school. Now, I was interested in science, and I knew one part of a frog from another part of the frog. But the monk sitting next to me, you know, he'd been lazy at school. He didn't know what part of a frog was what. So, you know, once you, know, you ate the, the meat on the outside, it looks like chicken, then you have to start eating the insides, the organs. You needed it to eat, to survive, it's your one meal of the day. And he, not knowing what he was doing, he pressed the bladder of the frog. Yes, you're right, it still had urine in. And that frog peed all over his rice, <laughs> even though it was dead. That was gross, but that's what we had to eat. That's all we had. And many of those marks got sick. It was very hard to eat. Some of the food, whatever crawled on the ground, that's what the villagers ate. They were very poor subsistence farmers. They can understand just why. The biggest health problem was your digestion. 
I don't know what diseases you've had. Diarrhea is okay, but dysentery. I remember having that once. Fortunately, uh, I knew some uh, natural health methods, and so I fasted for about a week, and I asked to have some garlic, raw garlic. I didn't, usually don't like garlic, and people didn't like me when I ate garlic, <laughs> because you have to smell all the time. But that's all I ate, just raw garlic for about a week. And apparently that can, um, uh, it's a natural antibiotic. So that killed all those bugs which were given like dysentery. It's a really horrible disease. You go to the toilet and all that mucus and blood and stuff comes out. It's really smelly. You stay there as long as you can. And then to make sure you're all empty, then you walk back to your hut and you turn around and go back to the toilet again because there's always some more coming out. And you know, that was for about a week doing that. But at least, you know, you survived. And to this day, you know, I realize on your retreats, wherever you go, please make sure you have food which you're used to, food which is delicious, because then you can digest it. And even the Buddha, I read the Vinaya, the Buddha was saying that. Make sure the food is tasty, otherwise it doesn't get digested. It's just the nature of our body to do that. So that's one of those sensory desires, which you just say, no, you have to make it reasonably tasty, so that people can actually live a healthy life, and especially on retreat, you can have a healthy retreat. And if that's what you can do, then it makes it easier to get in the meditation. Your sensory desires are just not there anymore. And even things like eight precepts. Do you have trouble with eight precepts when you're here? You know why? Because in the afternoon and evening you don't even see food. You can't smell it, it's not just around. And it's easy to restrain when you don't see these things. I remember as a monk, I was very happy in the monastery. I'd just have you one meal a day or two meals if you had a breakfast, and then your body was fine. But the problem came when you went to people's houses or you had to go to a ceremony, you're walking down the road. It may be a very hot day in Australia, and then you see the ice cream truck. <laughs> oh. I always saw the ice cream, ice cream truck in the afternoon when I couldn't have one. <laughs> and it always, I noticed, it always was more attractive when you couldn't have it. When it was actually there and you could just ask someone, the man asked you, do you want an ice cream at your bum? In the morning, yeah, I could have one. But I didn't, didn't want one. But when it wasn't there, it became even more attractive. That's something with sensory desire, they can fool you very easily. Even to the point, because of my background, you know, I was born in London. One of my favorite dishes in those days was fish and chips. And I remember when I became a monk, you didn't see any fish and chips ever in Thailand. That was not part of their diet at all. And even when I went back to UK the first time after seven years, I thought, oh, I'll get some fish and chips this time. But they thought, no, you know, he's been in Thailand, he likes a rice and curry. <laughs> <laughs> I never had any. But eventually, eventually, I think after about eight or nine years as a monk, I had to perform a funeral service for somebody you know, in the morning. There's no way I could get back to the monastery for the morning meal before noon. But I could, on the way back, go to a shop and get some fish and chips. And that was okay, because I had to eat something. So I was very excited. Today, I'm gonna get some real fish and chips. So I went to the shop, we got the fish and chips, 
and I was so excited, but when I started eating it, it was disgusting. All my fantasies never met reality. And I learned a lot about that. Sensory desire is very much thinking what it should taste like, what it should be like. When you actually get it, it's nothing like what you expected. It's really disappointing. <laughs> but meditation happiness and the joy of the mind, that always exceeds your expectations. That's one of the reasons why if you want something, you always make it appear much more delicious, much more satisfying, much more exciting than it actually is. That's one of the reasons why it's nice to let all of that go. You're here on a retreat and just enjoy peace, stillness, free from desire. And then, you know, you're not in debt anymore. You get more energy. What would you like to have for dinner today or for lunch today? Do you know what you're going to have for lunch? Imagine we get a real high-class retreat center. Sometimes I used to think, a retreat center, what kind of retreat center shall we have? Not just with high-class meditation cushions, and each with your own air con, so you're not cold, you're not hot, but also we can give you the, the menu in the morning. What would you like to have for lunch? I don't think I should have said that, should I? <laughs> now you're going to fantasize about it. <laughs> Not just fantasize about it, but also have a lot of suffering. I still remember one of the first times I saw an ice cream in Thailand. This was a big set of, I think it was Waysak. So we all went to Ajahn Chah's monastery. And I was just a very junior monk, so I sat you know, close to the end of the line, and there was another monk who was actually junior to me, but he sat in front of me. And they came with ice cream for everybody. And I thought, I haven't seen an ice cream in about seven years. Now today I was going to get one. And you get all excited. A young monk, okay, and this is what happened. They came with the ice cream, they passed it down, they went to fill up the tray to get some more ice cream. And they gave the last ice cream to the monk just above me. <laughs> and they never came back. <laughs> the ice cream ran out. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's teaching me a lesson. It was teaching me, don't want for anything, you can always get disappointed. So that's just with food and your food cravings. Now, in other times, this is what happens to me here. Sometimes at lunch or breakfast, someone comes up and says, Ajahn Bhav, try some of this, it's very nice. And I would always follow. I would actually eat some of that. And I'd really regret it afterwards. <laughs> yes, saw tell me, oh, why did I eat that? So that's why these days, I'm very careful, making sure that whatever food it is, it doesn't have to be tasty, at the very least it doesn't do me any harm. And that was the Buddha's standard. Whatever you eat, it's not for fun, not for fattening, not for beautification, only for the maintenance and good health of the body, to get rid of the old feelings of hunger and not get new feelings of overeating or stomachache. And that's a chant which we would often do before every meal to remind us this is a purpose to it. It's for your health, but nothing else. But that means that it's not indulging, it's reflecting. And you know, sometimes, you know, on purpose, sometimes we fast. And by fasting, I don't mean we go to McDonald's and get fast food. <laughs> oh, come on, it's okay to laugh. That's not a very good joke, I know, but... <laughs> because sometimes it's nice to give the tummy a rest. And sometimes you get much better energy. 
Now there are times when you're meditating, you get into some nice deep states, and because your metabolism goes down, you don't need so much energy. You don't need much fuel in the car if it's parked in the garage all day. And that's just like a body which is meditating. Metabolism goes down, you don't need so much, so you don't eat so much. Of course, my problem is my metabolism has gone down, I don't need so much food, but I realize that you need to give it to me. That's true. You say, Ajahn Brahm, I got you some special chocolate. Please accept it. I just usually put it in the bag and take it back and give it away. But if you're here, I have to eat it. <laughs> and sometimes, you may have seen me, I, I look at you, say, Kai C's gave me some chocolate, I look at you and I put it in my mouth, and you smile. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've actually given me something, I've actually eaten it. Not because I like it, because I understand how important it is to receive. You know, sometimes, look, I never wear socks. Even when I was in UK recently, it was very cold, no, minus, no, not minus six, six degrees, four degrees, that sort of temperature. I took a pair of socks with me to UK. I wore them the first day and I thought, I don't need these. And so I took them off and gave them away. I really rarely wear socks. I got very good circulation. Now, even in UK, you know, I didn't even wear a, a beanie on. I was fine. So one day, one day over in Melbourne, no, no, this was in Perth, this old lady gave me a pair of socks and said, I've knitted these myself. I didn't buy them from a shop. I made them myself just for you. Now what do I say? Do I say, sorry, I don't wear socks. <laughs> Take them away. And that's really mean and nasty. This old lady has spent, I don't know, weeks or months knitting this pair of socks for me. So I took them. And I was giving a talk. Now, a lot of the time when I give a talk, this is a bit of a narrow bench, but I usually put my, my feet together, cross-legged, so they can't see whether I'm wearing socks or not. But that day, I put my socks on. And as I was giving a talk, she was sitting to my right, as I was giving a talk, I started to move my body. <laughs> and exposed the foot. <laughs> and I was half listening over there. And you could hear her. He's wearing my socks! <laughs> He's wearing my socks! <laughs> and that's a beautiful part of being a monk. You know, sometimes you can do things you don't want. You don't need sort of uh, socks, but you wear them just to make a person happy. That is my desire, not sensory desire, but desire to value generosity. And the greatest story on generosity came from a story a long time ago, and it was about the Dalai Lama. And this story, he was still in Tibet at the time, so it was a really long time ago, and there was an American journalist who was following him around, doing an article about him. And this, obviously, a very famous and well-loved monk, the Dalai Lama, when he was in Tibet, he would go from village to village, and people would line up to do dana, give him some gifts. Not so much food, but other stuff and he would always accept it and give a blessing. And this journalist was getting more and more angry. This is supposed to be a holy man, the Dalai Lama. He lives in a palace, he gets the best food, the best clothes, the best everything. And now all these poor people are lining up to give him things. This is not right. And especially when this very old, poor lady, dressed in rags, who came up to the Dalai Lama and gave him a skirt, a woman's skirt. And at that the journalist couldn't hold back his anger. 
You call yourself a holy man, a religious leader, and you accept a skirt? You're a man, you will never wear that. And that lady needs it more than you do. She's really poor. What are you doing accepting all these things? And the Dalai Lama, apparently, said, yes, you're right. I don't need this. But that lady needed to give it to me. When I read that, I thought, wow, and now I understand generosity. It's not just that someone needs it, but somebody, at times, each one of us needs to be kind and needs to give. And even then the Dalai Lama said, in the next village, not in this one, I will give it to some other poor lady. Because it's true, I never wear a skirt, he said. But there's others who need it. And that means the person who receives that skirt, the one who really needs it, has happiness. And the person who gave me that skirt gets happiness. And I, as by the middle man <laughs> doing that transaction, I get happiness knowing just how uh, we've made two people at least happy. And that was gave me a huge understanding of what generosity is. It's not because you want something, but you want people to share. You like to see this giving and sharing, and that means that so many other people get happiness. Those socks which that lady gave me, I found somebody else who needed socks much more than I did. I didn't throw them in the bin. I just wore them once, made her happy, and then gave <laughs> to somebody else. That's the sort of thing which we get taught as monks and nuns of how to deal with the generosity of people. And it's not wanting, it's not sensory desire with food, it's like using it for its purpose, using generosity for its purpose. It is to make people happy, let go of, even just when we have, they had the donation boxes in the back over there yesterday that Amy and Annie were talking about, they're not even listening now. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> but you know, over in Perth, we don't call them donation boxes. You know what we call them? Letting go boxes. <laughs> <laughs> training how to let go. But that's just like the sensory desire, the wanting. And often, often, I shouldn't say this, but I keep on saying this, it's wonderful that as a senior monk when you don't get any donations, you know why? Because when I've run out of donations, got no money left in the kitty, when I go back to Perth, I can't build anything, I can't do anything, there's no money left, I can relax. <laughs> Sometimes, you need a donation for this project? No, I want to relax. But you don't have any money, you can't do anything. So any, anyhow, just that not wanting. You see sometimes people wanting stuff. Even at one conference once, there was one of the attendees at the conference, when it came to question time, they were very, very observant. And they asked a question, and there's all the monks, I was sitting next to this Tibetan monk, he was Western, but in the Vajrayana tradition, and this man put his hand up to ask a question, is it allowable? for monks to wear Rolex watches. And the monk sitting next to me, his hands suddenly went under the table. <laughs> <laughs> he was wearing a Rolex. Goodness gracious, that's going a bit too far. But you know, I, once I got caught out, somebody asked me, actually they never asked me, this was one of the disciples that got me out of trouble beforehand. When I was signing books, you know that I have to sign a lot of books. Sorry? Yeah. I was signing these books with a Mont Blanc pen. 
And they said, where did you get that pen from? And I said, well, someone gave it to me. Don't you know a Mont Blanc is a very prestigious, expensive pen? A thousand ringgits, how much it costs? And I honestly said, no, I haven't got a clue. The difference between a Bic and a Mont Blanc, I don't buy the pen. I haven't got a clue what it costs. But as soon as they told me that it was really expensive, of course, it went away. That was such a lovely pen to sign books with. <laughs> but, what, but what I have now, you know, sometimes people ask you, what do you need, what do you want? I don't know. But one of the people over in Perth, you've got to put your hands up to them. They were smart and they gave me a birthday gift which I'm really happy with. A stamp. <laughs> and it says Ajahn Brahm with a smiley face on the A, just like I actually sign with a pen. But it's a stamp, it's so much easier to do. You get the book, stamp, another one, stamp, another one, stamp. And you can't tell the difference between that and a, a Mont Blanc signature. <laughs> so, that somebody was using their head and offering something which made my life a little bit simpler. It's only a stamp, it's not expensive. So anyhow, this is when you want something, a lot of time you go scheming, even in your meditation. How can I get this? You think, you know, what food do you really want? You say, you've got a mobile phone. You can call them, get, grab, eat. You just go outside, don't come inside the retreat center. I'll see you outside. <laughs> so you don't get busted. <laughs> I still remember this was, I don't know if I should tell this story, but I'm, I remembered it, so I'm going to tell it anyway. There was a new monk who was my attendant. And you know, he's a bit nervous taking telephone calls because as a monk, sometimes you haven't taken a telephone call for years. So he had to take the telephone calls. And so one of the other monks, more senior, decided to give him a test. You know, there was you know, a big monastery, so there was like what we call the fax phone. And he called in the mainline phone. And the monk said, excuse me, this is Domino's pizza delivery. We've got a pizza for you, but the gate is locked. Can you please come and unlock the gate of the monastery? And I was sitting next to this, <laughs> and this attendant monk, and he was so confused. He meant no one orders a pizza in the evening for body down the monastery. <laughs> and so I said, I'll take the call. And then as soon as I took the call, I recognized the voice very well. It was, it was one of the junior monks who <laughs> was impersonating a Domino's pizza delivery boy. I took it very, very well just to test out, <laughs> test out the new monk, you know, just for some entertainment. Sometimes <laughs> that's what we get up to. I don't know if I should have told that story. But anyhow, it was funny, and everyone was forgiven in the end. So, but anyhow, the, <laughs> the desire for sensory comfort, try and make yourself comfortable, but don't go too much for sensory desire. I mean, what do you want? And sometimes you look at even the bed, the bunks which you're on, the top bunk, the lower bunk, it's just a bunk, that's all just so you can go to sleep and have a nice rest. What else do you want? Food, water, as long as it satisfies the body. You don't need entertainment. Entertainment, you get it from me when I tell funny stories. <laughs> I don't know what else you want. <laughs> you know, there's sometimes that even monks, we can't do entertainment. So somebody was really trying to you know, push the envelope, as they say, because we were doing a fundraiser for the nuns' monastery over in Australia, Damasara. And there was a very wealthy Malaysian woman. And she showed me 
this check for 10,000 Aussie dollars for Dhammasara. He said, I will give you this check for Dhammasara Nuns Monastery only if you sing a song. <laughs> I said, monks can't sing. You know, we're not allowed to. He said, well, if you don't sing, I'll put this check in the bin. They put me in, in, a, in a dilemma. You know, you want to help, you know, create some nice monasteries for women. But then you can't break your precepts. So I figured out the solution. And I said, look, it's really important we have a monastery for women, run by women, for women. I will sing a song. You can record it if you wish, as long as I can choose the song. She said, yeah, of course. So I said, give me the check first. <laughs> And then I said, I choose the song. It's a real song. It was a very big hit when I was young. A song by uh, the pair Simon and Garfunkel. Have you heard of them? Yes. Yeah. And the song is The Sound of Silence. <laughs> <laughs> and I was quiet for about 10 minutes. Yeah. I never sang or said anything. <laughs> That's the sound of silence, my version. Okay, you win. So I could keep the check and give it to the Dhammasara nuns. <laughs> but <laughs> otherwise, singing you can't do. All that sort of stuff. But you can have the beautiful lightheartedness and fun. When you keep your precepts, it's much easier to laugh. And those people who said, be good, and said, no, it's no fun. I would argue forever on that. No, being good is much more fun. You have more energy, less worries, don't need to defend yourself, and you feel good about life. And people trust you. And wherever you go, that sometimes you say something, and they realize, yes, you're being honest. How many people, when they say something, can you trust them straight away? You know, if that's what they say, you know, that's the person I've known for such a long time, it must be correct. They may make a mistake or say things the wrong way around, but you know they never deliberately lie. And it's beautiful when you know people like that. I still remember an old school friend who came to visit me in Thailand. And he was a young man. When I told him one of the loveliest things to see in northeast Thailand is the morning arms round. So please come on the morning arms round. So what time is it? Well, we usually live about 5.30 a.m. 5.30? I'll never get up by 5.30. And I told him, don't worry, I'll come to your door about 20 past 5, knock on the door to wake you up, and you just quickly get dressed. You don't have to wear that much on arms round, and you can come with me on the arms round. And of course, that's what I did. And on the way back from the arms round, he said, that was such a unique experience that night before because I knew that you'd be there, as you said, at twenty past five to knock on the door and wake me up. And you were. I said, I live in London. So you can't trust anybody to do things like that. But I knew because you're a monk, a spiritual person, I knew you would actually do that. And they meant so much to me. And those sorts of things, I take that for granted. But can you always take that for granted? And maybe even your child, your partner, you know, your parents, your child. Are you, when they say, yes, I'll be there and I'll pick you up at that time. Can you trust that? It's wonderful when you can. It makes life so much easier and more joyful. So anyhow, that's when we don't have any ill will, we have trust. And that's also part of uh, those five precepts. Already here that sometimes some of you say you've done something wrong and you're guilty. Oh my goodness, 
just forgive yourself, let it go. It's more important you can learn, grow, let go, go beyond that, so you can have some peace and happiness in your life. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. Because sometimes that the aversion, the aversion leads to you know, punishment, revenge, and that just makes the mind very tough and very, very unpleasant. And also it means you just want to block away whatever happened. So you never learn about why people make mistakes, why you make mistakes. I always say the mistakes are part of life. I remember giving this talk at a mental health conference in Perth. Now, please excuse the language, it's an important part of the story. If anybody does, doesn't like this word, you can actually excise it from the recording if you want to. But as I was giving this talk about mental health, this was to the clients of the mental health service, not the psychologists, but the people who went to the psychologists. And when I went in there, they didn't know me, they knew I was Ajahn Brahm, that's my name. But a couple of them, when they came out afterwards, after the talk was finished, they came up to me to apologize. What do you want to apologize for? Because when we saw you coming in, you weren't a professor, you didn't have academic credentials, we didn't know who the heck you were. And so I said to my friend, who is this, excuse me, coming in to teach us? That's a very nasty word. And they said, we want to apologize for saying that. Because you made us laugh and cry. Your talk was magnificent. I said, what part did you really like? And we liked the part where you said about the trees in the forests. One of the first times I, I mentioned that story. I'm a forest monk. I live in the forest for the last almost 49 years. And I said I noticed something in the forests. I've never yet seen a perfect tree in any natural forest. All the trees are bent, crooked, twisted, with some of the branches torn off by the storms. And in those holes in the trunk, left by those branches which have fallen off, that's where either birds or animals make their nests. They're an important part of the forest. And all the leaves on the tree, trees, on the branches and twigs, it's very rare to see all those leaves perfectly green. There's some yellow ones, some brown ones, some eaten by bugs. And even the bark of the trees is never smooth and perfect. There's been bushfires, things have hit them. All the barks of the trees are all damaged. And I said that the trees which are the most damaged and twisted and bent by misfortune, they're my favorites. They're the ones which are the most beautiful. I'm being honest. They're the ones which I like the most the bent, twisted, damaged ones. And I said that any of you in this mental health conference who are bent, twisted and damaged, number one, you belong. You belong in this great natural forest of humanity. And number two, those of you who are really damaged, really bent, you are some of my favorite trees. You're the ones I would love to sit under or have my photograph taken with. And they got there. I identified so easily with the bent and twisted human beings damaged by life's problems, either a physical infirmity or some accident or just by you know, people who abuse them. You belong. You're not so discriminated against or put in some dark corner and forgotten about. You belong. You're some of the most beautiful people. 
So you don't need to get angry at yourself. No negativity about who you are, what happened to you. You accept that as something which is like an adornment to who you are. And they turned around straight away and said, thank you, we cried, we laughed. Thank you so much, your talk was meaningful. Showed us a different way of looking at our mental health issues. So the anger is the opposite way around. We want to get rid of something, throw it away, tell it off, make sure it disappears so we never have to see it anymore. In meditation, don't get angry at anything. Whatever happens, when you're meditating, if some really silly thought comes up, it's there for you to learn from. You know when I taught you about the Empress Three Questions meditation, now is the only time you ever have, it's the most important time, give it importance. The thing in front of you is the most important meditation object, no matter what it is. What if it's like pain? What if it's like memory of some terrible thing which you did or someone did to you? Can you stay with that? Is it right to the third part of Emperor's questions to care for it? Yes, very much so. These are things which happened to you in the past. Care for it and you learn from it. Gives you the understanding. This is not like a permanent scar on you. This is like an adornment on you. When you learn to learn from it, why did it happen? What actually is it? It changes the way we perceive the unpleasant things which happen to us in life. We stay with it, care for it, and learn from it. Every time you reject something out of the ill will, you say, no, I don't want to watch this. That means that you haven't learnt. When you learn, these things come in, you don't see them as negative anymore. You say, oh yeah, this happened. I've learned from it, it will never happen again. And you can move on to some very beautiful mental objects. So you let go of ill will, you let go of wanting, all wanting. Often when I meditate, if the, there's some kind of blockage, you know, something, my meditation is not going as smoothly as it normally does. Why? I don't keep on pushing and fighting and struggling and striving. I always like to use that insight. Why? What's going on? And it's nearly always the case. It's because I want something. That's one of the reasons why, to overcome blockages in meditation, I ask myself, what do I want? What do I want? So I can find the answer. And sometimes I find stupid things. I want some fish and chips. But I had some this morning, what's the big deal? And, or I noticed that when I was a young man, I want fish, and I was a vegetarian. I had a choice, but I chose not to. What is this with this wanting? Wanting can be very, very weird. And anyhow, what do I want? I want to get jhana. No way! It's not got from wanting, it's got from being still. You're so still, still for long enough, that everything starts to slow down and stop and become peaceful. So ask yourself that during meditation, what do I want? If you want something, you're blocking the meditation progress. Want well, nothing in the whole world. Happy to be here, content, easily satisfied. I don't know how many of you have been over to places like Perth, but we do a translation into English of the Metta Sutta. And part of that is learning how to be content and easily satisfied, not proud or demanding in nature. And often I saw pause there, 
And I said, this is really telling you something about the Buddha's teachings of meditation. To learn how to be content. I don't want a jhana. Whatever happens is fine by me. Then you are unlocking the doors to jhana by having that sort of attitude. Content and easily satisfied, not proud. I'm a monk, I should get jhanas. Not proud, doesn't matter who the heck you are. And not demanding in nature. I don't demand to get a jhana. I'm just content, easily satisfied. Then your doors of jhana are wide open. So it's no wanting. Ill will, or even a worse form of wanting, a weird form of wanting. Because it makes you tight and tense. And it's very really hard to satisfy that. Just leave it alone. Be, be cool. Be peaceful. Not uh, wanting at all. Actually, do you, do you know that chant, the meta chant? Now, some of you do. <coughs> when you listen to the chant, sometimes you could understand why bhikkhunis have such a hard time in life. Because it says in that chant, we chant it so many times every day, let none deceive another or despise any being in any state, let none through anger or ill will <laughs> we harm upon another, whatever living beings there may be, omitting none. If you know the chart, it's very funny when you interpret it that way. It does mean N-O-N-E, not N-U-N. But nevertheless, it makes people laugh. So then you have the restlessness and, remor and remorse. That's Udhacha Kukucha. That means remorse. That's why when somebody asks me, is it okay to have remorse? I say, no, it's an hindrance. If you've done something wrong, made a mistake, you learn from it, but you don't make it a psychological barrier to further progress. That's the whole point. You made a mistake, learn, do better next time, and no problem. That's called growth. That's where we get better every time. And, but it's the thinking about things. I don't know why people do that. Actually, I do know why people do that. Why your mind wanders off. Because you're not happy being here. You want to go somewhere else. Why do people go home and turn on the TV? Or why do they go even on the way back home on a bus or a train, go and turn on their mobile phone and just chat with people, find out what they're doing, stupid stuff. Why do you do that? It's a form of escapism. Because you don't know how to be here and be peaceful right here, right now, enjoying this moment. Sometimes, I will confess that once I was on an aircraft and I watched a movie. I didn't listen to it, I just watched it, I never had any headphones. But the screen came right in front of my seat and I couldn't miss it. And the film was called, and many of you may have seen it, Armageddon. It was an adventure movie. But I never had any, any headphones. So I just watched it without the music, without the dialogue. And I was laughing my head off. <laughs> it was one of the most funniest movies I've ever seen. In particular, I remember, you can work out from what you saw on the screen, uh, apparently there was some big meteor was about to smash into the earth. As soon as I realized that, I knew it would never smash into the earth. If you have any, any movies like that, they would never, no one would go to see them. You know what was going to happen. I, I never wrote the script, I never understood about what the script was, but you can work it out straight away. It's very predictable. The very last minute, Something will happen, and somebody will be the hero, and they'll blow up the meteorite, and it will just miss Earth. Just! <laughs> but anyhow, they had to get to the meteorite on this spacecraft. And when the spacecraft, one of the spacecraft, landed on this meteorite, 
you know, it, was, it wasn't just like a landing strip, no, it was just like a rock with lots of crevices and peaks. And they smashed into this meteorite. And there was flames and sparks and explosions everywhere. Now for about five minutes, like pyrotechnics. And then, if that wasn't enough, it fell over a cliff and went to the very bottom, maybe a kilometer down, and exploded again. More sparks, more flames, more explosions. Then it finally came to a halt. Now that would be enough to kill everybody ten times over. But then it all went quiet and I saw a hand come up. You know, the, the screen over there was coming from underneath somehow or other and reached onto like some sort of bar and pulled himself up. He survived. And I looked at the people sitting next to me can see the happiness and relief on their faces. To me, it was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever seen, and I couldn't help but bursting out laughing. <laughs> and especially when his head came up, there was no soot marks on, no sweat, and his hair was perfectly <laughs> quite like he'd just come out of the hairdressers. <laughs> <laughs> to me, oh, that's really stupid. How can you believe in that sort of stuff? <laughs> well, they all did. I thought, oh, what a great movie that was. Really realistic. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, when you see reality with reality, because apparently all that music and dialogue, that it is there to control your emotions. You know, a lot of times. If you ever see it like a ghost movie, you can always see the sounds get very spooky and very low. It reminds me of the story of this man. He came to one of my talks, and after the talk was finished, you know, it went on a bit, as I always do go on a bit, I passed the usual time. There were two ways back home. The first way was actually the long way around. There was a shortcut, but the shortcut meant going through the cemetery. So he thought, I don't believe in ghosts, you know, ghosts can't harm you. So he decided to go through the cemetery. And as he was walking through the cemetery, one thing you notice in the cemetery, the lights on the street are always closer together. In the cemetery, they're always further apart. So it's much darker in the cemetery. So he's walking through, the, he got to the halfway mark through the cemetery, nothing had happened at all. As he went a little bit further in the cemetery, you know, closer to the, the exit gate, he could swear that he could hear something following him. You know, it's probably just a dog or something, but nevertheless, he noticed he was walking a bit faster. And as he was walking faster, whatever it was was following him, he could hear more clearly. Bump. 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 And he made the biggest mistake of his life. He turned around to have a look. And what he saw was so incredibly impossible and scary. What he saw was a coffin, <laughs> vertical, but still the cobwebs and the dirt just falling off it. Bump, 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 chasing him. He was being followed by a coffin. So he turned around and he ran as fast as he could. The gate wasn't that far. He thought if he gets through the gate and out of the cemetery, he'd be safe. So he ran fast, but he could also hear behind him, bump, 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 bump. <laughs> the coffin was chasing him. He got outside the cemetery gate. <sighs> well, the coffin never stopped. <laughs> it went down the road, chasing him. He was really in big trouble. But then his house was very close by. 
So he got to his house, he got a, like a garden gate. He never opened the garden gate, he jumped over it. <laughs> Save time. And he could see, bump, 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 bump. The coffin was catching up on him. Vertical coffin. No wood and the dirt all over it. He didn't know what he was following him for. But he jumped over the garden gate, ran down the path, got the keys out to his front door. He dropped the keys. <laughs> you know what happens when you're really nervous and afraid? You make mistakes. And that coffin, it couldn't jump over the gate. It crashed through it. BAM! It went right through the gate. And there he was, he could see it you know, coming really close to him. He picked out the first key he could, put it in the lock. <sighs> so fortunate it was the right key. He turned the lock, opened the door, jumped inside and banged the door shut. Just as the coffin came to the front door. He could see it through the little glass they have you know, in the front doors of people's houses. <sighs> he put all the spare locks on, the bolts, everything to make sure he was safe. He was in his house now. He'd be safe. Bump! <laughs> <laughs> the coffin started to hit the front door. And again, bump! And you can see the, the hinges start to come off you know, from their screws. This was a really strong, supernatural coffin. What to do now? It was only a matter of time before that coffin broke through the front door of his house. And then he would have no place to hide. He had an idea. He went up the stairs to the second story, to the only other room which had a lock on it. Now the bathroom. So he went inside the bathroom, locked the door, and he could, before he did, he just looked, bang! The coffin broke down the front door. And the coffin came inside his house, and the coffin looked to the left, <laughs> couldn't see him, looked to the right, couldn't see him, and the coffin looked up and saw him. <laughs> so he jumped, he jumped inside, he jumped inside the toilet, the bathroom, locked the door, and went against the wall just hoping. But he could hear. The coffin, bump, bump, <laughs> bump, was climbing the stairs. And then, bump, as the coffin started crashing against the, the bathroom door. He knew he had no hope. If that coffin could break through the garden gate and the front door, the bathroom door was so weak, so he just waited. Bump! 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 And the coffin broke through. The door of the toilet just fell to the ground. He was face to face with his coffin. No more escape. Almost instinctively, he reached for something to throw at the coffin. He got this bottle of medicine from the bathroom shelf and threw it at the coffin. It was a glass bottle. It broke and all this brown liquid fell on the coffin and the coffin stopped moving, never moved again. What he had chosen was cough mix. <laughs> it stops the coffin. <laughs> <laughs> Of course it stops the coffin. That's what the, the <laughs> that's what the doctors and, and the people in the medicine department know. So if you want to get chased by a coffin, make sure you've got some cough medicine. <laughs> Throw it in the coffin, and that will stop the coffin. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that and having some nice meditation. I'll say some more about the five hindrances later on. <laughs>